uh, or good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for joining the uh, live webinar. Um, you can see on the screen uh, the title and my name. My name is Teras Miami. I'm a consultant dermatologist based in London um, and work with a number of uh, laser devices. We have half an hour today to uh, talk about the treatments of acne and acne scarring using a combination of energy-based devices. So that is going to be the title. I will start first with acne. When I talk about acne, I talk about acne vulgaris, which is the common type of acne. And then afterwards, we'll move on to the treatment of acne scarring. So just a little bit of an introduction and a warm up for those of you um, who are dealing with acne or who are thinking of uh, treating patients with acne. Acne is a multifactorial disease. Um, there are four key pathogenic factors that play a role, as you can see on the slide. There is the grease gland or the sebaceous gland that tends to be overactive and produces excessive sebum. There is also some blockage um, at the follicular opening or what's referred to often as pores due to abnormal cell turnover, so you get hyperkeratinization uh, and that leads to clogging up of the, of the pores. As a result of overgrowth of one type of bacteria in the grease gland, that we call the key acne bacteria, because they are very lipophilic, so they like a, a lipid-rich environment, hence when the grease gland is overactive, the pea acnes will multiply and colonize the grease gland. As a result of that, our immune system will mount an immune reaction, which we call an inflammatory response. And that leads to redness uh, that is often seen and observed in patients with acne. So when one tries to manage acne, you try and, and tackle most of these factors where possible. Treatment of acne, um, there are a number of treatments for acne. And I put on top the medical therapy, which um, is often a combination of oral or topical. Um, one particular drug is isotretinoin, which is often given uh, solely as, as an oral medication. Medical therapy does remain the mainstay of treatment for the moderate to severe types of acne. However, in real life, when you deal with patients, there are some patients who do not want to take um, medication or simply have contraindications or develop some serious side effects with some of the medications, and therefore, some patients will seek alternative non-medical treatment. Other modalities and treatments that are used in acne include chemical fields. These include the alpha hydroxy or the beta hydroxy acid, such as the salicylic acid field. Mechanical, such as microdermabrasion or comedone extraction, particularly for the congestion uh, type. Um, And I will be talking about light and laser. Just to um, mention that you are able to type in questions. You will be able to see a Q&A section where you'll be able to type in questions. However, I attempt to answer the questions as much as I can at the end of the webinar. So from now on, we're going to be talking about the role of light and laser in the management of acne. So how does it work? I think if the question is, does lasers or light play a role in, in acne vulgaris, how does that work? The answer is yes, definitely. And there are two main mechanisms for that. There is a photochemical and a photothermal effect. So the photochemical effect means that the light that are, we are using, whether that's from a blue light source or, for example, from a laser. In this case, I'll be talking about my experience with a pulse dye laser, which is a yellow light laser. That has a chemical effect um, on, on the skin, on the grease gland, and by killing the bacteria. But there is also a photothermal effect from the laser, and that is when the laser will generate some heat, and that heat will lead to coagulation of the small vessels that feed the grease gland, but also plays a role in, against the inflammatory response, but also heating up of the grease gland 
that reduces its activity. And remember, overactivity of the breeze gland also contributes to active acne. So generally speaking, for the photochemical effects, we rely on the shorter wavelengths, which is the blue light, or the wavelengths that lie within the so-called story band, which is from 500 to 600 nanometers. And you can see that the pulse dilator with a wavelength of 595 nanometers fits nicely in the story band. And what happens is that the P. acnes bacteria that populate and colonize the breeze land produce what we call protoporphyrins. And these protoporphyrins interact with light, such as blue lights or the yellow lights from the pulse dye laser. And that interaction of the protoporphyrins that's produced from the P. acnes bacteria with the light leads to a chemical reaction to the formation of um, reactive oxygen species leading to uh, bactericidal effects and killing of the bacteria. So that is the photochemical effect of how the, the lights will treat the P. acnes bacteria. But remember, if I just go on to the previous slide, there is also the photothermal effect from the heating effect. Now, with the exception of the pulse dye laser, most of the photothermal effects on the microvasculature, i.e. the small vessels that heat the breeze land or heating up the breeze land, will be with a longer wavelength and the infrared. And that works through overheating of the, the breeze land and the microvasculature, and that leads to reduced sebaceous gland activity. At the right bottom part of the screen, you are able to see just a brief abstract, acne vulgaris and light-based therapies. It's one of my articles that I published. Um, you are able to get my um, contact details through Sinarong Candela, and we will be happy to um, provide you with a copy of that article that outlines all the way uh, how the photochemical and photothermal effects work with all types of uh, light and laser devices. So in general, I have a lot of experience using uh, lights and laser-based devices in the management of acne vulgaris, and in particular, the pulse dye laser. Um, and from my experience, multiple sessions are required. Now, the interval is important because, remember, the P. acne bacteria tend to regrow and overpopulate at a fairly rapid rate. And therefore, the interval generally tends to be somewhat shorter than the traditional four to six weeks. So if possible, two weeks interval treatment with a pulse dilator for inflammatory acne will give you better results. And my experience, and also from the published literature, was the pulse dilator works better in inflammatory acne compared to the comedonal congestive acne. However, there will be still uh, somewhat a role for the comedonal acne, but in particular, it works better in the inflammatory component. And where possible, combination with topical treatment. Um, I put my patients on a salicylic wash uh, and a topical retinoid uh, where they can tolerate it, even if that's just two to three times a week, and they stop it a couple of days before the laser treatment and then restart a couple of days um, afterwards. But combination of topical treatment with the pulse dye laser yields, uh, from my experience, better results. Now, one might ask, how do you know it's not the topical treatment. Well, I know that because many of my patients would start on the topical treatment and they have slow improvement, but they see a dramatic difference and improvement as soon as I start treating them also with the pulse dilator. And there are some patients who simply just don't want to use any topical treatment, and I solely rely on the pulse dilator and get a good results. So that was a brief introduction on acne vulgaris and the role of light and laser uh, on how they work through the photo, um, photochemical and photothermal effect. And now we'll talk more specifically about the device and the settings that I use. So you can see the V-beam perfector from Candela, which is a pulse dye laser um, that emits light on the yellow uh, range, 595 nanometer. And as I explained earlier, the effects are predominantly photochemical and photothermal when it comes to the management of acne regards. There is a lot of evidence that exists in the management of acne, and I also have a lot of personal experience using this device in the management of 
uh, inflammatory acne, and it is my go-to laser in the management of acne. You can see um, some images on the left-hand side of inflammatory acne. Of course, uh, medical therapy would be the first choice, but in this case, there were contraindications. Patients opted for non-medical treatment, and after a series of few uh, sessions with two weekly interval, you can see nice improvement there. Another case, just after a single session, one single treatment, and you can also see uh, a reduction in the erythema, the redness and the inflammatory component, and with a few more sessions, um, we will be able to get better results. So now, more importantly, the parameters. And as with any laser treatment, um, there is no set standard parameter for every condition in every patient, because every patient will um, require some adjustments to the parameters, but in general, when you're using the V-beam Perfecta pulse dye laser in the management of acne, um, you're using it in subperperic settings, so that is settings whereby you do not get purpura, you do not require purpura in, when you treat acne, um, and in general, more than one pass uh, where where it's tolerated will give better results. I um, almost always do two passes. And then on the inflammatory spots, so the papules and pustules, I will then do another stack. So I will go one pass, the whole cheek, or the affected area, if that's the forehead or chin. And then another pass, so that's not stacking at the same time, but just two passes. And then on the inflammatory lesion, there will be another shot. If they're really big, large nodules and tender, I might stack two, two pulses. Um, and then I will use my uh, typical vascular coagulation settings if there is some background erythema. And here you can see my typical non purpuric settings, which I will spend a couple of minutes on this because it's important. Depending on the spot size that you will use, your fluence will change because when you uh, change the spot size, the fluence will have to be adjusted as well. But the pulse duration remains the same. If I see uh, vessels, usually it's the 10 millisecond I will use. However, for just pain erythema, we'll go for the shorter pulse duration of the 6 millisecond or the 3 millisecond. So typically, for some of the examples that you saw earlier, where there's a lot of inflammatory acne associated with erythema, my first pass will be with a 7 millimeter spot. If I'm using a 7 millimeter spot, will be with 3 millisecond using 7 to 7.5 joules per centimeter square. That will still be subperperic, but you're generating enough heat for a photothermal effect, but also having a photochemical effect. And then my second pass will be with a 10 millisecond, 10 joules on a 7 millimeter spot. And then afterwards, I will go and stack on the individual spots. So, in conclusion, when it comes to um, the section of acne, the pulse dye laser, and in this case, it's the machine from Candela, the Zebeam Perfecta, um, has a 595 nanometer wavelength, which is in the uh, yellow light -like range, and it has both a photochemical through the interaction of the protoporphyrins that's produced from the P. acne bacteria and the yellow lights leading to reactive oxygen species production and killing of the bacteria, and the photothermal effect through the generation of heat that leads to coagulation of the small vessels and heating of the sebaceous glands. In practice, when you're using the pulse dye laser in the management of inflammatory acne, you would require multiple sessions and typically somewhat shorter intervals for around two to four weeks. And in practice, again, you get better results when you try, where possible and where tolerated by the patient, to combine the pulse dye laser treatment uh, with other topical treatments. You can also combine it with some oral medication, but you have to be uh, mindful that some oral medication will have photosensitivity, uh, so you just need to bear that in mind. So that was the uh, first part of the webinar on acne. 
And now we'll move on to the second part of the webinar, which is really a continuum of inflammatory acne, which is this debilitating um, condition of acne scarring. And these are just some images of different types of acne scarring that you can get. But in this case, we're going to be concentrating on acne scarring affecting the face, because in most of the cases, that's what we deal with, and that's what I see in the clinic. So a brief introduction on acne scarring. Acne scarring is the result of the inflammation, the inflammatory response of the acne and the follicular rupture that ensues from that. And there are certain um, processes that take, uh, play a role, such as the toll-like receptor to 2 activation and activate protein 1, AP1. And I think what's, what's really important is to just highlight the point that you can get acne scarring from any severity of acne. Of course, when the acne is very severe, the, the chance of developing acne scarring is much higher. And, and in practice, that's what we mostly see. However, I have seen acne scarring as a result of what we as doctors would grade as mild acne. So I think it's important also not to ignore mild to moderate acne, to take that seriously, and also to treat that. Um, early on to prevent the uh, progression and formation of acne scarring, because acne scarring uh, can ensue from any uh, type of severity of acne. Um, simplistically, we divide acne scarring into atrophic, i.e. loss of tissue, or hypertrophic or keloidal, such as the previous example where you show on the shoulders, uh, these raised scars, they can be hypertrophic or keloidal. But most of the time when acne scarring appears on the face, and the vast majority tends to be an atrophic type, of which there are three subtypes, the rolling, the ice pick, and the box scars. And here you can see images of the ice pick scars that tend to be narrow but deep, and the rolling scars that tend to have these fibrous strands that pull down on the base of the scar, and then the box scars that tend to have these upright shoulders uh, and somewhat uh, shallow compared to uh, the ice pick scars in terms of the depth. And we know from experience that box scars tend to respond better and easier to treat compared to the ice pick scars that are harder um, and the rolling scars in between. But often I would use combination treatment, which I will come to that in a second. But when it comes to the role of uh, lasers or energy-based devices, I would say for the management of acne scarring, Again, that is largely due to the photothermal effect that leads to stimulation of collagen. We get feature proteins that play a role as well. And we know traditionally we have the ablative and the non-ablative uh, modalities. And I think it's fair to say from the literature, but also certainly from my own experience, that energy-based devices in general, when used appropriately with the right selection and the right settings, tend to give us superior results compared to other non-energy-based devices modalities in the management of acne scarring. And this is just to illustrate uh, how the ablative fractional uh, lasers or resurfacing work, whereby you get these columns of ablative light um, ablating areas of tissue, but leaving normal skin in between. That leads to shorter downtime, faster recovery, and in my experience, with the right patient, tends to give better uh, results. So what machine do I use for um, the management of acne scarring if I'm choosing a fractional ablative laser? Here you can see from Cineron Candela a core machine, a carbon dioxide CO2 laser that I use a lot in the management of acne scarring. Um, and it has three key uh, modes, which is the aesthetic mode, the core intima mode, which I will not be talking about, and the surgical mode for the more surgical. And what you see is on the left hand side, when you go on the aesthetics mode, it gives you the choice of either a fractional mode or a static resurfacing mode. And from the fractional mode, again, you can choose four settings the light, the mid, the deep, or the fusion. Now, I want to talk first about the deep mode because this is the one mode that I generally tend to use first when it comes to the management of pattern scarring. And the deep mode, as you can see, on the left um, side of the image, on, on the glow one, 
you can see narrow columns, so that's 150 micron uh, width, and then depending on the fluency you'll be using, we can go as deep as 750 micron. So depending on how deep your acne scar on the cheek is, you'll be able to match that with the fluence and then treat the deep components of the acne scar. And then you can choose the density you want. The machine will give you a maximum density of 5%. And here on this slide, interesting histology from Tineron Candela using this machine, the core machine, which basically shows you that as we increase the energy, uh, the depth of penetration increases, which is important because if you have a shallow acne scar on thin area of skin, then you will use low to moderate fluences. However, if on thick cheek skin, for example, you have a very deep acne scar, then you're going to be using high fluence because you know that the depth of penetration of this deep mode, deep fractional mode, um, corresponds to the fluence that you'll be using. Now, one important feature of this um, device um, that I use a lot and I like a lot is the so-called fractional fusion mode, which is a fusion of two modes, which is the deep mode, which I just explained, but also a more superficial mode that's called the mid mode. And the mid mode is there um, for the surface of the skin, for more epidermal resurfacing. So when you have, for example, the box scars, um, that tend to be a bit more superficial, they will also improve when you're using uh, the mid mode. So often in combination of using the deep and the mid modes, i.e. the fusion mode in this case, you'll be able to tackle and target the deeper components of the acne scar and the more superficial components of the skin. And for example, in this example on the left hand side, um, there are some deep um, acne scars um, with um, upright shoulders. So in this case, I will use the, the shape that matches the scar. We'll be using a high fluence, so 60 or 70 millijoule with a deep mode alone curve and 5% treats the base of the individual scars because these are deep scars as you can see on thick skin. And then afterwards, we'll be using the fusion mode going over the treated area. So the base of the deep scars will be treated with high fluence, the deep mode, and then the whole, the entire affected area will be treated with a second pass. I will treat that with the fusion mode, which will be the combination of the deep and the mid modes that will also improve the surface and texture. And here again, after one session, you'll be able to see where you will be using the combination of both the deep and the mid modes. You will be able to target these uh, scars, but also improve on the uh, texture. And I must say that in general, I tend to tell my patients that often I will have to use more than one treatment because I think it's um, it's the right thing to do because um, you match the expectations of the patients and in general from my experience for acne scarring you would require more than one treatment session even if you're using fractional ablative lasers to get very very nice results. Um, darker skin types yes you need to prep them uh, prepare them for four to six weeks beforehand um, and instruct them on the post um, aftercare, but uh, you can also certainly get nice results. And this is just after one treatment using the fractional ablative core laser. So that's how I deal with the core laser. So it's deep mode, high fluence density on the base of the scar, and then using the um, fusion mode to treat the area. And my density for the mid mode. And which is part of the fusion mode will increase if I want more surface improvement or epidermal resurfacing. The other nice machine that um, is also used, and I have used a lot for acne scarring, um, is the E2, which is a fractional radio frequency, which is not a laser. But fractional radio frequency relies on tissue impedance or the resistance within the tissue to generate the flow of electrons. In simple terms, what you get is you get with the fractional radio frequency, you get a narrow column of oblation at the surface, but you get a deeper column of 
coagulation at the base. This is just um, the screenshot of showing you um, where you can see that depending on the energy that you'll be using, you can get um, deeper um, coagulation circulation. And I think this image will show it. What you see is you see a reverse probe where you see a narrow zone of oblation but a wider zone of coagulation. And what this means in practice, this means shorter downtime, but more impacts where it's required, which is the dermis, and less impact on the surface of the skin. And very in, in, in very, very simple terms, the way this works is the epidermis has less water content compared to the dermis. And therefore, the pins that are used are smaller. So when you have, use smaller pins, whereby that was going to be the plus electrode. The, the flow of electrons was going to have to go from the small pin to the larger pin on the side, which is the, the negative or the minus electrode. And the small pin means the density will be high. And when you have a high density, you will increase the temperature within the epidermis to exceed 100 degrees Celsius, so you get a, a zone of ablation. As soon as then, the electrons, the flow of electrons, um, traverse and pass the epidermis and find themselves into the dermis, the dermis has a higher water content compared to the epidermis, which means also that the electrons will diverge because radio frequency and electrons will like a water-rich content, which means that the density will be lower. When the density is lower, the, right, the temperature rise will be lower as well, so it doesn't exceed 100 degrees, therefore you do not get ablation but it reaches temperature between 50 to 80 that gives you the coagulation. So that is how fractional radio frequency uh, works. Uh, and in this case, uh, for example, you will use uh, the high mode, you will use high fluence on the affected area, and then lower uh, fluence on the surrounding area. And you can do more than one pass. Two to three passes, three passes on uh, lighter skin types, on higher skin types, I will uh, stay with two passes. Uh, but you can certainly, as you can see here, also use that on darker skin types with less risk of post-inflammatory pigmentation. Radio frequency is what we call colorblind, therefore there's no stimulation of melanocytes, but I do appreciate that the inflammatory response can sometimes lead to some temporary post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. However, uh, this is almost always transient. Here's a nice case of some before and afters, after three treatments using the fractional radio frequency, and you can see nice improvement. So fractional radio frequency, minimal ablation to the epidermis, a wider zone of coagulation in the dermis with much less downtime compared to the fractional ablated laser. And sometimes you can combine the two. And I would say I would start with the fractional ablated laser, get maximum impact, and thereafter, we will continue with the more shallow, improved acne scars using the fractional radio frequency. So if you have both machines, both devices in clinic, you will be able to combine both of them at the same time. This is one of um, my um, this is one of my articles that I have published last year on the use of fractional radio frequency in the management of acne scarring reviewing all the existing uh, literature and evidence, and also adding in my own cases and my own experience. And the one take-home message from this article that, is, that was published in the Journal of Cosmetic and Laser Therapy is that from all the published studies, beyond six months, there was no post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, including skin touch situations. So once again, you can safely treat skin touch five and six, with a fractional radio frequency for acne scarring, and there may be just some temporary post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but from all the published studies and literature, there were no cases of persistent post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation beyond six months. And that's also been my experience, and I have treated many in patients as well. Now, so we talked, when, when it comes to the management of acne scarring, we talked a bit about the role of the ablation, ablative uh, carbon dioxide laser, the ablative CO2 laser, and then talked um, about the uh, fractional radio frequency, CP2, 
And now finally, we'd like to talk about a nice new device, which is the peak away and um, whether it has a role in the management of factory starving. Just a little bit of an introduction about this device. The Pico Way has three wavelengths. It's the Pico second laser that has the shortest pulse duration, the highest peak power, and the highest peak power means that you are able to get high fluences on a large spot size. It has a 532 nanometer, a 1064, and a 785, which is not an Alexandrite, but it's a titanium sapphire plate that is ideally suited for the management of blue and green tattoos. But in this case, I'd like to talk about one particular handpiece of this uh, machine, the PKOA, which is called the Resolve handpiece, or in other words, the fractional handpiece of the Pico second laser. Just like with the carbon dioxide laser, the CO2, there's a fractional mode. Just like with the radio frequency with E2, there's a fractional mode. And the same applies to the Pico way, which is the Pico second laser, there's a fractional handpiece. And it comes in both wavelengths, the 532 as well as the 1064. And it relies on this holographic fractional technology where there is a holographic beam splitter that comes out from the lens, which means that the light comes out, coming out of the lens will be split into equal columns of high spikes of um, energy. But look at the total energy, which is 0 0.4 joules, is very minimal. Uh, this is a painless procedure. I've had it my, done myself as a trial, just one sheet. One sheet. This is a painless procedure, and it is a, uh, associated with very minimal downtime of perhaps just a little bit of redness and swelling for a maximum of two days uh, you, if you use uh, several packs. And this is an example here on the left and right hand side where you can see an improvement after just one treatment. This is a new treatment, so the peak away resolve, I'll usually use four to five passes um, on modest uh, fluences. There is no end point. There will be a little bit of erythema and edema, but from my experience, the result corresponds not so much with the fluid as much as with the number of passes. So by, you don't necessarily need to use high fluences. From my experience, mid fluences give um, equivalent results, but the difference will be with the number of passes, i.e. the more passes you will do, the more impressive the results are compared to less passes. And again, here on the left-hand side, you'll see one of my articles, um, which I published a couple of years ago, really, on the use of picosecond laser beats beyond tattoos, because I think most, most still associate picosecond lasers with tattoos. But on this article that I wrote and published, it uh, clearly also shows all the other uses of the picosecond lasers that had of tattoos, which do not just include pigmentation. Certainly with the fractional handpiece, it includes also acne scarring. And there are many, many published studies now on the use of the fractional handpiece of picosecond lasers and the management of acne scarring. And on the right-hand side, you can see one of the newest articles published in the, in the Journal of Lasers and Surgery and Medicine using this exact handpiece from Pico Way Candela, which is the resolved handpiece um, in the management of acne scars. So how do I approach acne scars? Because remember, as I showed you earlier, there are also um, other types of acne scars, such as rolling scars and ice pick scars. If I put in the middle the column of main treatment, that will be energy-based devices. EDD stands for energy-based devices. The reason I call, call it energy-based devices and not lasers, because remember the fractional radio frequency is not a laser, and therefore I lump them together and call them energy-based devices. So my main treatment is energy-based devices, but then sometimes there might need to be a pre-treatment. So a patient, even if you haven't been treating that patient for an inflammatory acne with pulse dilator, but in, a, in, a, in addition to his acne scars, he has a lot of erythema. So post-acne erythema, erythema associated with the acne scars, some call it macular erythema. Um, I will first treat with pulse dilator in my non purpuric coagulation setting. So again, that would be a 7 or a 10 millimeter spot, 6 or 10 milliseconds. And then if I'm using a 7 millimeter spot, it would be a 9 to 10 joule. If I'm using a 10 millimeter spot, 
it will be somewhere between 6.5 to 7.5 feet. Uh, the two passes and the two treatments reduce the erythema and then we'll move on to using the energy based device. And sometimes for any persistent um, post CO2 laser, if there is erythema, you can nicely treat that with a pulse dilator. So that's one of the reassuring things that if you treat a light skin patient with the fractional CO2, and let's say two months down the line they still have some erythema, you can nicely treat that with the V beam protractor, again with my non perforic coagulation setting, which I uh, showed earlier on. For some of these very deep ice pick scars, I tend to punch it size them first. So I do first surgical procedure, but I use a two millimeter um, punch biopsy kit. I will punch excise them because then I will change the scar morphology from the very deep, narrow, deep ice pick scars into more superficial scars that are easier to treat with the fractional modalities that I that I explain. For the very deep rolling scars, what you need to do first is to just gently stretch the sides of the scar. So you put gloves on, you gently stretch the side of the scars. If it if it's still tethered and it's still, if the scar is not coming up to the surface and stretching nicely, that means that there are many strands, fibrous scar tissue strands, pulling down at the base of the scar, and therefore you will need to use a procedure called substituting first. So I will subside these tethered areas from the base of the rolling scars first, and then we'll move on to my main treatment, which is the energy base. And as post-treatments or adjuvants, I put their retinoids because I do want to maintain that collagen production and healing, but usually I will introduce that four to six weeks after my uh, treatment. Sometimes you might need to, for example, if you have very deep rolling scars, my pre-treatment will be subcision, my main treatment will be energy-based devices, but for some of the areas that still require some volumization, I can go there and either do fat transfer, which one of my plastic surgery colleagues does, or use some of the temporary or semi-permanent fillers. Um, at the base there, FRF, that stands for fractional radio frequency, and that's what I explained earlier, that sometimes I would start, for example, with the main treatment, which would be the fractional CO2 laser, the core, and then we'll say we'll maintain afterwards with two to three treatments using the uh, the e matrix fractional radius frequency after. So this diagram shows more or less in a simplistic way um, the way I approach acne scars. And the reason I put the pre and post treatment is because often in reality it's a combination approach. So we're coming um, toward the end of um, the webinar and conclusion acne scarring as I say, it requires a combination of treatment. There are many devices that are available, but the one I uh, use in practice are the fractional uh, CO2 laser, which is uh, the core laser from Sinron Candela, the fractional radio frequency, which is the E2, and the Pico second laser from Candela, which is the Pico way laser that has an additional fractional handpiece that's called the resolved handpiece that you can use on all skin types from one skin type 6, and I have also treated skin type 6 with a result. And often, multiple treatments are required. So, thank you for listening, and we'll now uh, look at uh, the last, there have been some questions that we'll uh, try, with time allowing, um, we'll try and answer some of the questions. So there were some nice comments from colleagues saying nice webinar, um, educational. So thank you very much for that. I think a couple of colleagues had some issues with um, accessing first. Um, but I'm trying to see if there. So there is one question. What is the difference between pulse dye laser and yellow laser? Um, so there is one company that produces a yellow laser at a wavelength of 577 nanometer. Um, the pulse dilator from BB Imperfect is 595 nanometers, so it's a longer wavelength, deeper penetration. But the BB Imperfect also 
has additional modes such as uh, an elliptical spot size that you can nicely trace individual sealant ectasias. It also has dynamic cooling devices, but it also allows you to use larger spot sizes too. Um, so uh, there are some uh, technical differences as well. Um, parameter, someone asked for parameters um, in ACME. So once again, VB perfects the parameters for ACME. Let's just keep it simple and use a seven millimeter spot. Okay. You use a seven millimeter spot. My first pass will be to three milliseconds using seven millimeters. That would be one pass. But there's a parameter A, but there's not much better team, then I would do, be doing two passes with those settings. So two passes with seven millimeter spot, three milliseconds, 7.5 or 8 joules. So if it's, if it's very light skin type, we'll be using 8 joules. If it's slightly darker skin type, we'll be using obviously lower fluid. If there is a lot of associated erythema, my second pass will be purpuric set, non purpuric setting, coagulation setting. So the, the second pass will be 7 millimeter spot, 10 milliseconds, somewhere between 9 to 10 joules. And then I will stack on. In addition to that second pass, I'll stack on the individual uh, spots. If you are using a 10 millimeter spot, then all you need to do is the pulse duration remains the same, but then you decrease your fluence by 20 to 25 percent. So if you're using on a 7 millimeter spot a 10 millisecond, but using a 10 joule, if you, if you go and use a 10 millimeter spot, then you should be using a 7.5 or an 8 joule. If you get purple, then you go down by half a joule and check that you do not get purple because you want sub purpuric um, fluid. So I hope that um, that explains. With regards to the acne scarring, once again, at the base of the scar, if you're using a fractional CO2, will will match the size of the scar with, with the size of the light shape. I'll be using the deep mode, we'll be using a high density, which is the maximum density, 5%. If it's thick skin on the cheek and a deep scar, we'll be using around 70 millijoule. If it's on thinner part of the skin and shallower scar, for example, on the temple, then we'll be using around 50 millijoule. And then, that's the first thing I will do. And then, if I, I generally tend to also use the second path as a fusion mode, keeping the same Density. Remember, with the fusion mode, your density for the deep mode uh, is standard 5%. But based on how much epidermal resurfacing I want, if it's a light skin type and there's a lot of epidermal uh, damage and I want to reset, have a more impact on the epidermis, then I will increase the density to 35 or 40%. But warn the patient there will be a longer downtime. If it's a slightly dark skin type, or there is not much um, impact required on the epidermis in terms of epidermal resurfacing, then you can use a lower density, such as 20 to 25 percent. So when you're using a fusion mode, your deep mode percentage remains constant at 5 percent. So the core energy will correspond to the depth that you want, generally speaking, depending on how deep you want to go. For acne scarring, it's usually somewhere between 50 to 70 millijoules depending on the thickness of the skin and the depth of the scar. And then the mid-mode parameters, your density will depend on how much epidermal resurfacing you want. And the fluence from the mid-mode, again, how much ablation uh, you want. So hopefully that, uh, that is clear. Um, probably because of the time, we'll, we'll look at um, one last question, or a couple of questions. Let's see if there's a question, because there are some um, Repetitive questions, but we'll try and see if there is another question that is more, again, parameters. Um, by the way, you will be able to, this webinar is recorded, so you'll be able to get access at any time and um, listen again to the webinar, and you'll be able to hear all these um, parameters again. Um, another question, do you treat the fusion mode the whole area? or just the scars? Um, that's a very good question. Now, if I'm treating a chickenpox scar, for example, 
then often what you find is you find normal skin, you find normal background skin, but just islands of um, atrophic scars. So in that case, you can just treat solely with the deep mode, um, and possibly just a fusion mode on the scar. But often what you'll find with acne scarring, is you'll find deep scars, but pretty much most of the cheek is a fit. So yes, in acne scarring, in most cases, I tend to use also fusion mode for the entire area because most of the time the entire area is, um, is affected as well. But if you do have a case where you have an acne scar, very localized in one small area, just a couple of scars, which is uncommon, but um, we do see it occasionally, then yes, you can just go and treat the scars um, uh, individually and then see, uh, see what happens. Uh, and again, there's another question, can you treat all degrees of active acne with E2? Um, so, as I said, active acne is not an indication for the E2. So, if there is active acne, I do not use the E2, which is a fraction of the frequency, but I will use the pulse dilator. Um, the E2 is only used for active scars. But if the question was, do you treat all degrees of active acne with the pulse dye laser, uh, then the answer is yes, following discussion with the patient. I'm a dermatologist, and therefore medical treatment is always going to be my first objection. Um, but as I say, sometimes there are occasions where patients do not want to take medical treatment or simply cannot or have contraindications to make medical treatment, and in that case, we'll use uh, the pulse dilator. If you have very severe acne, then I think you really will have to be using medical treatment. But for the mild to the moderate acne, which is the commonest type of uh, severity of acne that I see in clinic, then yes, certainly the pulse dilator, the medium perfect can be used, and it can be used very I think given the time, we'll have to stop because most of the questions I see are more or less repetitive uh, related to uh, the settings, which um, are available, as I say, because this webinar is recorded and therefore you'll be able to uh, gain access to it at any time and will be able to uh, hear the settings again. Should there be any specific questions, you'll be able to get my contact details through Sinarong Candela and I'll be very happy to uh, give you an individual reply and response. I would like to thank you all for joining this webinar and listening to me, and good luck with the management of acne and acne scarring with energy-based effects. Thank you. This concludes the webinar.